You know, I didn't think Spider-Man 2 would be that much of a sequel. I thought it would be predictable, that it would have all the same problems and all the same strengths as before. One reason being a fairly simple observation. There were some things about the previous games that didn't seem like they had any room left to improve. Another reason being the question of why. Why bother? You're under the thumb of Marvel and Sony, expected to sell their systems. You've got a proven formula, and a community not blind to the first game's flaws, but remarkably contented with the way things are. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Can you imagine if Rocksteady thought that way? Maybe I was cynical, but no, I didn't think we'd see our Arkham City. And hey, I was right. Almost as often as I was utterly, gloriously wrong, this game, if nothing else, is a deeply conflicting experience. Okay, here's one of the things I was wrong about. I didn't think they could make New York look any better than this. Then Miles Morales came out. The ray tracing, the lighting, the weather. I said, what's there to say? It's basically just New York. It can't get better than this. Yeah, okay, dumbass, why don't you go back to the Minecraft videos? Then Spider-Man 2 came out, and it did it again, managing somehow to fill me with the same awe felt on that first day in 2018, as if these old, familiar streets were new once again. Is it magic? No. Is it better lighting? Partially, yes. But the most exciting thing about the facelift is the detail. There's more of it. The walls are more detailed, the roofs are more detailed, and graffiti is painted pretty much everywhere, bringing a sense of lived-inness, along with the simple benefit of colour. Spider-Man 2 is like a rainbow compared to its predecessors, both because there are more sources of it, and because the colour that exists now stands out against the sun's light. Spider-Man 2's New York is rich with specific, noticeable characterizations that either didn't exist or blended into the background before. The addition of Queens and Brooklyn seems as though it should have meant a lot, perhaps to those who find some part of the Spider-Man fantasy fulfilled in swinging through Peter's own friendly neighborhood, it did. It didn't for me. It's pretty much just more streets to swing through, and we already had a bunch of those. I imagine the low buildings might have had an impact on how you moved, but not really. For me, the best thing that happened to the map was getting to Queens and Brooklyn, swinging from bridges, diving between its girders, hopping from boat to boat, or surfing the tension. That's something fresh, something you couldn't do before, and something that had a further benefit than just mixing up the movement. It made the world feel more alive, the river now filled with people, an extension of the city instead of feeling like a moat around Manhattan. Cars busily moving from borough to borough, and so many of them. When people talk about what the PS5 did for this game, they'll mention ray tracing and load times, but not as often the density of traffic. Life is no superficial detail. The difference having pavements filled with people and streets filled with cars and a river filled with boats, and skies filled with planes and helicopters, gusts of wind and you, is incredible. Spider-Man 2's New York is boiling over with the movement of humanity. It's comforting, almost, to simply be among it all. And it's the most striking thing thing about going back to play the old games, not the graphics, the emptiness, the barren roads in what's meant to be the capital city of the culture of the world. A sense of life is an immaterial thing, but its value is immense, and perhaps even more so when you're playing as a superhero. It contributes the sense of being a protector, even the sense of having an audience. The only flaws that come to mind are, one, Insomniac's newfound willingness to let city activities muddy the view, make the world look a bit gamey, a bit like it's made for you, not in spite of you. And two, the absence of the police. I realize it's a political stance, but it is possible to distance Spider-Man from the police and allow the police to exist at the same time. Without them, it feels like a piece is missing, and knowing why they're missing pulls you further out. But in the end, these are drops in an ocean. The city's a runway model. And I hope this story serves as a lesson. If you ever catch yourself thinking, they can't improve, this is literally perfect, you're probably wrong. And I know how it is in New York. If anything could stand to be improved, it's the cost of living. How does anyone make it in this city? Hang on, I got an idea. Okay, realistic 3D graphics, 800 unique champions, free to play, right. Yeah, give me a minute, mate, listen. You're gonna need something to play in the hospital, and boy, do I have the game for you. That's right, baby, a mobile RPG. Focused on collecting heroes, customizing them, and combining them into an effective team for battles against bosses or online players. Now, you don't want to miss out on the Monster Hunter crossover. Before March 5th, there's five themed legendary champions up for grabs. Talkin Rathalos, Ruiner, Fatalis, Alatrion, and Zinoga. But if you're on for seven days straight before March 5th, the Rathalos Blade Master's free. So make sure to... Hello? Are you guys listening? Don't you want to hear about the new Winter Champions? No, babe, you don't understand. Glazea's soul guides dress like that because she breathes out of her skin. It's all part of the game's deep lore. Now, you want to power up with this fat dwarf, Torm in the Cold, because he's got two AoEs for clearing out the late game hordes. Okay, okay. And not okay. 
What's up guys, it's your boy J. Jonah Gamerson, back at it again with another Raid Shadow Legends video. Make sure to shoot us a clan invite, cause Raid just dropped their biggest update yet. 100 new stages, twin bosses, me and the boys are going for the mythical champion tonight. Wow Miles Raid Shadow Legends looks W Skibbity Riz, I am going to download it today using the QR code on screen or the unique link in the description for free silver, XP bruise and an in-game rotisserie chicken, then I will use promo code Raid Xmas, which works for new and old players, and join White Light's Cars 3 Film Society clan. Thanks Hayley. Now, web swinging. I think I've said my piece on the first game. It looked real nice, it felt real nice, but it was slow and it was shallow, and it could definitely be improved. Miles Morales took a few steps forward, with its revolutionized trick system that allowed you to exaggerate your swagger. But Spider-Man 2? I honestly didn't believe I'd get to say this, but they've fucking done it. Well, they've partially fucking done it. You know how we all thought the animations were as good as they were gonna get? Yeah... Oh, ha <laughs> ha. I got nothing more to add. But Insomniac do. We've got a swing assist slider in the options menu. Essentially, it allows you to reintroduce the pull you should feel towards the building your web connects to, which brings a remarkable enhancement to the feeling of physicality. Adds a challenge, too. You're gonna make mistakes at first. You'll need to master the counter steer. And that might not seem like much, but something to master? In this system? It's like rain in a drought. It's worth its weight in gold. Second win is being able to go faster. Now, speed is nothing new to a registered Web of Shadows enjoyer such as myself, but the feeling of speed is night and day. The effects of the wind, the blur of the detail of Insomniac's New York whooshing by. Holy fuckamoly. If physics could not, this would be it. But don't let that distract you from the mechanical benefit. Speed means you need to make decisions and inputs faster. Oftentimes, much faster. And that right there is that ever-valuable thing. Challenge. Of course, gaining speed also serves as a reward for effective movement. Makes a good dive so much more satisfying than it was in a game where you'd hit the cap so quick. And likewise, losing speed serves as a punishment for failure, introducing a light level of tension. Light but not insignificant. The corner swing serves as a patchwork solution to the fact that rapidly shifting momentum never did look right. But it's slick as shit, and it's not as automated as it looks. Timing's on you, and when the speed's high, that's a small degree of challenge. But the main attraction are, of course, the web wings. It's the Just Cause wingsuit. Well, fair enough. Couldn't have picked better homework to copy. Just Cause's wingsuit was the best wingsuit in gaming, and it still is, but Spider-Man's is a very close second. What makes this feel so good is precisely the fact that it isn't stable. It's turbulent, the air has character, and Spider-Man's body reacts in detail to sudden shifts in force, amounting to a constant feedback that just makes it feel… real. Through the visuals alone, it's easy to imagine the sensations of speed and wind. Alongside this is a turning circle that has been very carefully tuned with respect to the buildings to make turning amongst them challenging but not impossible, which is precisely why turning amongst them feels as good as it does. It's been said that the web wings are a little too strong to avoid disrupting the Spider-Man fantasy. Every soup can fly, but only Spider-Man can swing. I don't know, I'd have more sympathy for that point if there was any extrinsic reason to let them dominate your movement, but there isn't. Insomniac have balanced smartly. Unlike Just Cause, the web wings can't gain momentum on their own. Their use is maintaining the momentum you gain from something else. Want to extend the arc of a swing? That's when you use the web wings, but their speed will bleed off quickly. You'll repeatedly, as in many times per minute, find yourself in situations where it would be smart to open or close the wings. Recognizing that is depth, and in practice, movement is made to feel more dynamic and energetic. The wind tunnels and updrafts are another success. Lots of movement-based games incorporate environmental opportunities, now Insomniac do too. They encourage spontaneous decision-making. I'll go for that. I'll make a move I didn't initially intend to get closer. What's particularly good about the tunnels is that they provide a boost when you reach the end, but you can move that boost in any direction, so the wind tunnel can be beneficial in a different way each time you use it. There's a lot of cool shit here, but what really changed things for me was the contribution of precision. You can be precise now. Of course, you always had the point launch, but that's the game doing it for you. And you could always swing, but Insomniac swinging has never been great in terms of fine control. So the web wings are introducing something new here, the ability to thread the needle, to weave between pillars for no other reason than fuck it, to see a gap and go for it, armed with the knowledge you can probably do it if you focus. It's fun, of a kind you couldn't really have before, but perhaps more importantly, it's the most Spider-Man thing in the world, so strongly in the spirit of what moving like Spider-Man is meant to be, an expression of youth and rebellion, skateboarding made super. 
Yeah, the web wings are good in my book. Not a game changer, but very much significant. So, if you've ever thought Insomniac's web swinging was literally perfect, that it couldn't be improved, or God have mercy on your soul, that it shouldn't be improved, what do you think now? Exactly, that's what I thought. Apology accepted. So let's do this dance again. The web swinging is incredible. Unfortunately, it's sort of a piece of shit. The problem, once again, is that Insomniac forced Spider-Man to release his web when they decide the swing is complete, which continues to impose frustrating limitations on expression, creativity, and options for efficient movement. You can't organically loop in the vertical direction. You can't loop horizontally at all. You can't always go directly upwards off a swing because there's no consistency for when the line will break, and it'll sometimes happen before you're vertically parallel. What's the big deal? Is a question asked mostly by people who've never become familiar with a decent web swinging system that wasn't made by Insomniac. How would they know how natural it becomes to move with your web in ways other than forward and up? The big deal is that those things aren't just useful, they're a means of expression, a means of inhabiting the role of Spider-Man. And the other big deal is that when I can't do things I was able to do 20 years ago, in a system I still hear people calling literally perfect, it gets me feeling like the Web of Shadows intro. Now, I know what you're saying. And you're right, Insomniac did make an effort. There's a loop-de-loop -loop move now. Unfortunately, it's far from an ideal solution. It's a move, not something that happens in your own way or because of your momentum, but a specific motion made to happen by pressing a button under specific conditions, which, unsurprisingly, ends up being incredibly limiting. You can be traveling at half the speed of sound in the forwards direction, but that specific condition I mentioned is a dive, so only downwards momentum counts. If you're diving but you didn't press the dive button, then it still doesn't count. If you succeed, you can only loop once before Insomniac comes back to drop kick the controller out of your hands by force releasing your web again. If you fail, you don't fall backwards, you lose your line, and you sure as shit won't be changing your axis. You loop vertically, nothing else. It's restrictive. Considering it was meant to solve restriction, that's a bit like fixing a pothole with a big grey sticker. It's inorganic, like you're playing with code instead of physics. And then there's the fact that it isn't even finished. The physics shits itself if you loop anywhere that isn't a bog-standard street. The animations have no idea what to do if you want to use the loop to go backwards, which is the most useful thing a loop can do. The loop-de-loop -loop made for some great memes, and the game is better for having it, but it's a half measure in concept and a mess in execution. So the question then becomes, why? It seems obvious that the better solution would have been to simply remove the restriction, to not break your line in the first place. But perhaps it's not that simple, because although Insomniac's movement is based on physics, it is closely tuned with assists and boosts to make doing what you're doing most of the time feel as good as possible. But perhaps the curated physics that makes swinging in a straight line feel incredible don't play so well when you're upside down or perpendicular. Perhaps that's why the system doesn't like you moving slowly and won't let you stop. Perhaps that's why the otherwise unparalleled animations hop on that Marvel's Avengers shit if you ever try to. Perhaps this system is too far gone, and that to fix it now would mean foundational change. Perhaps it'll never happen, but until it does, there'll be nothing perfect about Insomniac swinging. Another problem is the contextuality of the control scheme. R2 is run on the ground, parkour on uneven ground, charge jump in combination with X, swing in the air, and run on walls. The same button does five different things depending on the environment. It's a brilliant idea if you want to make it easy as possible to have a good time. It means less fumbling about learning control schemes, and it means that unintentionally swinging into a building isn't treated like a failure. But of course, there's a downside to that, and that's never been more apparent than it is in Spider-Man 2. In one way, it's because Spider-Man 2 is much faster, and there's only so precise you can be with Insomniac Swing, which means in tighter spots, you're going to wall run at times you didn't mean to wall run, changing your momentum, slowing you down, and throwing you off. And if swings are cancelled when you touch a building, then you can't swing alongside a building, which is limiting. This is made considerably worse if you have swing assist off. For Insomniac, R2 is the go button, and one of its most frustrating intrusions is this thing. The automated zippy thing that happens when you contact a surface with an open space close above it. What if, insomniac, there's more than one place I might want to go? Huh? Or take circle. It's dodge during combat, roll with the web wings, and corner swing if you're near a building. But near a building isn't precisely defined, and it won't work if you have too much upwards or downwards momentum, which also isn't precisely defined. So if you're using the web wings and you slip out of range, you'll find yourself doing something very different from what you intended. As the campaign progresses, the problem takes on a second layer. Dodge during combat, remember? And in Act 3, the city is almost exclusively inhabited by things that want to uninstall your testicles, which, on multiple occasions, 
occasions, made me want to do their job for them. And what about X, which is slingshot when held with L2 and quick recovery if you touch the ground carrying momentum? The problem here is that quick recovery always takes priority over the slingshot, so you can't slingshot if you can quick recover. Which is kind of annoying, because the best way to recover quickly isn't actually quick recovery. It's the slingshot. For Christ's sake. Please iron out the contextual controls, Insomniac. Moving on to everything else. To the pile of small things about the movement that aren't quite there yet, that still have a way to go. Like wall crawling, which is still a mess, that can't handle anything that isn't a completely flat surface and is categorically outdone by 15-year-old games. Wall running still can't move in any downwards direction. You still can't web zip moving straight along a building. The airborne web zip still looks strangely weak, and the upwards web zip still is strangely weak. In a game where the slingshot can send you halfway across the map, taking so long to ascend a building stands out as uniquely slow. I like that we got fall damage this time, but its remarkably incomplete implementation often seems backwards. If the value of fall damage is the tension of knowing there is a danger in major mistakes, and therefore a greater thrill associated with risky moves, then it does seem strange that fall damage doesn't exist where ever such tension could be contributed. Hit a wall at 100 miles per hour, slingshot headfirst into a building and you'll bounce right off. Fall damage does exist, however, on the loop-de-loop. -loop. Okay. And if you don't break your fall. And that doesn't seem right to me. With Insomniac's movement, it's very difficult to hit the ground by mistake, because unless you have swing assist at zero, you're given a boost to stop you touching the ground. In fact, the only time you would make a hard landing is if you were deliberately going for a badass superhero entrance. For me, the only thing full damage meant was that I couldn't do that anymore. I don't know, man. Still think Web of Shadows had this right. Hit a thing above X speed and you go splat. Simple, funny, functional. The movement abilities carried over from Miles Morales feel a bit undercooked too. Go up a bit. Go forward. I could already do both those things, faster and much better looking, and with the same level of input. I do catch myself forgetting these exist. So yeah, Spider-Man 2's movement is a fucking disgrace. Except for the part where it isn't, boys. It's a fucking victory. It's faster and deeper. It's the things it needed to be most, but it's also its own thing. Thanks to the tricks and the wings and the tunnels, not just standing alongside Ultimate and Web of Shadows, but standing apart. Spider-Man 2 soars towards its full potential, but the point that'll matter just as much in the long term is that it's not there yet. Now here's something that isn't even close. New York. As an open world, the things you'll be swinging between, and perhaps the most infamous of the first game's shortcomings. Well, they still come short, and I'm not coming at all. There are a handful of side missions in Spider-Man, but most of the things to do in New York are profoundly mundane. You will do a weak puzzle for a weak reward and then you will listen to Uncle Aaron make a brief and surface level comment on a fond memory or a crime he once committed. There's only one crime you need to atone for, Uncle Aaron. Perhaps instead you'll be lightly wiggling the stick to stay in a wind tunnel. A decent but strangely limited test of the movement mechanics that the game attempts to spice up by chucking bombs at you. Sometimes that works, but a bafflingly large amount of the time you can avoid the bombs by not moving at all. And you won't be doing anything else related to movement, because in the game with the highest skill potential yet, by miles, they took the time trials out. But they added shooting bees with a drone. What? You will punch Sandmen, and you will receive a single sentence of dialogue that usually tells you the same thing the last one told you. And you'll be doing a lot of punching people, and that's pretty fun because punching people is fun, but three games in, yeah, I'd hope for something more substantial than this. It amounted to an open world I chose to ignore. Do I want to shoot bees with a drone, or do I want to keep swinging? I needed the upgrade materials, but most of the time, I still chose the latter. The random crimes, meanwhile, have never been anything less than serviceable. They're mostly combat, and combat is fun, and there's a value in being able to fulfill the basic vision of the Spider-Man fantasy. But we are three games in. There's room for something better than serviceable. Somewhere the second game was on its way to approaching. We had crimes that took place in more than one place. Crimes with mildly adventurous objective design, where a point had to be defended or a thing had to be hacked. Well, what happened? There is no such thing and no such equivalent in Spider-Man 2. We've gone backwards. In some ways, we've gone as backwards as it's possible to get. I was naive again in thinking the car chases couldn't get less interesting than a jazzed up two-button quick-time event. Failing, of course, to consider the possibility of a one-button quick-time event. And there's only one animation. And in this game, there'll never be backup or more than one vehicle. There's no thrill, no fun, and no point in this. To the game's credit, scraps of an effort have been made. Different factions will join mid-fight with another more often than before. Miles Morales' war crime returns, you know what I mean. 
the activity, not the genocide. And best of all, sometimes you'll find the other Spider-Man. It's no Arkham Knight, it's purely aesthetic. But man, is it an aesthetic. The strength of the fantasy of fighting side by side with another cool superhero, teaming up for takedowns and zipping off into the distance is undeniable. And of course, it lends the world a further sense of life. So it's not all bad. It is, however, mostly bad. So you see what I mean when I told you I was right about Spider-Man 2, just as often as I was wrong. Sometimes it's a triumphant leap forward. Sometimes it settles for mediocrity for the third time in a row and for the highest price yet. Sometimes I was wrong about the things I'd be right about. This is a deeply conflicting experience. And I was sure as shit wrong about MJ. My biggest instance of disbelief was when I learned Insomniac had doubled down on the worst part about Spider-Man 1, because I didn't believe it could be redeemed. Moving from the depth, spectacle, and refinement of Spider-Man's stealth, combat, and movement, to an MJ or Miles mission that offered one path to follow, and one way to solve problems, challenging nothing more than the player's ability to fulfill basic cues was like being mugged by the game itself. How much time and thought and money would it take to reach the point where the game wouldn't be better if you simply didn't have these parts in them at all? And why bother? What's the point? Because I recognize the potential in creating a contrast to the power of Spider-Man, involving us in the perspective of the vulnerable, those towered over by the streets of New York, who view its villains with fear and confront them with bravery. But is that so high a potential that all the effort wouldn't be better spent somewhere else? Uh, time to find out. Part of Spider-Man 2's upgrade is their place within the campaign. There are three to the first game's six, and that's immediately useful to stop them from getting old. They're faster paced in terms of narrative, which helps alleviate their characteristic boredom, but they're also within a much faster paced story. So with one particular exception, they're still capable of providing a valuable break. Then, of course, there's the fact that they're good now. It begins with a thorough navigational freedom, not just a second path, but several interlinking with several others. Impressive? No. Important? immensely. It's depth where there was once none. It allows the use of MJ's abilities to satisfy, if only because you can trust that enemies weren't scripted to respond in a certain way. And failure. It's been fixed. MJ avoids the instant game over, as well as incoming projectiles with a new dodge button, introducing the gameplay of recovery, a tenser, more frantic dimension to stealth, a value that, again, simply didn't exist before. As dumb as it may seem in the moment for seasoned hunters to give up searching for a sighted intruder. Oh yeah, and she's also packing heat. It's a web shooter. Not quite the same energy as Mary Jane Wick's Spaz 12 from Web of Shadows, but it's ammo management. It's aim. And because of the webs, it's environmental thinking too. Basically, she's fun now. MJ and her levels can be mastered, and to such a degree that a confident player can move through them with almost no downtime at all. So, sounds amazing. In comparison to an actual war crime, judged by more reasonable standards, what we've achieved here is, yeah, competence. You can see why, in spite of the deserved praise, I remain unconvinced that this is worth what we might have had instead. By the end, walk him down, Watson meets Spider-Man's enemies with more confidence and aggression than Spider-Man himself. And as seasoned hunters get mugged off by the dozen by a journalist, Insomniac have to make their own villains look like complete muppets. It's fun. But it's ridiculous, and the notion of a disempowered perspective is entirely thrown out the window. I'm running out of defenses. Uh, well, when Spider-Man loses himself to the silly slime, the most valuable perspective is hers, the one who both fears and loves him, and Insomniac used that to great effect. But that's not what happens most of the time. Times, I couldn't shake the feeling that Insomniac weren't yet ready to double down on disempowered gameplay. On that note, Let's talk about Act 1. Peter's a teacher now, which would make complete sense if he could be even remotely confident that Miles would literally never need his help, or if there were not many, many jobs that are higher paying, easier to get, and infinitely less likely to immediately fire you for being mysteriously absent during a crisis than school teacher, or if expecting Miles to deal with every spider problem during weekdays wouldn't make it blatantly obvious to his classmates that he is Spider-Man, or ruin his education, mister, you need to finish your college essay, Miles. But it's fine because Sandman does 9-11 and Peter immediately gets fired so you don't have time to think about it. Five thousand dollars. This man's mortgage is five thousand dollars. May mortgage the house to keep Beast afloat. And now I'm sinking. Maybe Aunt May deserved it. 
MJ offers to cover a payment, and it's established that she's working for Jonah now, that she believes it's from inside the Bugle that she can make the biggest difference. The chemistry between these two still isn't quite there yet. And hot take, I do think the problem mostly lies with Lowenthal. The man is brilliant, and this game is his tour de force, but he's just a bit too first dates with MJ. He speaks like he's trying. I know, I had the whole semester planned out. Next week, we were gonna make a potato-powered helicopter. <laughs> I don't deserve you. There's a performed softness in some of his lines, a slight formality in his politeness that should be long gone between people who've known each other since high school, comfortable enough to be talking about moving in, comfortable enough to keep quiet about the way she looks, am I right? Seriously, MJ? A yellow woolen jumper on a collared shirt? Plimsolls? Huh? Good god, if it's drip or drown in this world, MJ's sleeping with the Titanic. Anyway, the theme of balance is introduced in an impressively corny flashback upstairs, commenting on Peter's attempts to take on too much responsibility at the same time. Harry arrives immediately after, and you ride off into the sunset to reminisce about the old days. At length, which eventually culminates in Peter being offered a job at Harry's new Good Things Corporation. Then Craven shows up, breaking Martin Lee out of the raft, which Miles isn't best pleased about, on account of Lee chefing his dad. Then Black Cat shows up, being hunted by Craven, but she immediately teleports to the Bone Zone on the other side of the planet, and it's incredibly underwhelming. And then Venom shows up, and it isn't underwhelming, it's Harry and he's a good guy. Christ on a bendy bus, this is a lot. Most of it is established very well and at a very high pace. It's a moments-driven story, where the constancy of cool shit happening stands out clearly as its foremost strength. It's incredibly entertaining, though not without exception. Sometimes things aren't established, well, or quickly. Perhaps you've heard something along those lines about Spider-Man 2's early game, about the violent whiplash of being ground to a halt by one of its many Life is Strange-ass walking sections, featuring riveting, man, gameplay. Here's the thing. People never say that about Cyberpunk. Good as the gameplay is, they say the opposite. You come to look forward to the game at its slowest. Same said for The Witcher, for Red Dead. Point being, frustrations with this isn't TikTok-induced dopamine addiction. It's that given the opportunity for intimate, personal storytelling, Insomniac don't do a particularly good job. And in absence of those qualities, walking around does get pretty boring. I'm afraid I have to reaffirm the narrative. On repeated runs most of all, it results in the sense that these parts of the game are something you just have to slog through to get to the good bits. I think the problems really start when Harry shows up. There is a value in simply spending time with Harry, but it's like 30 minutes of time most of which establishes that Harry is, and was, nice, and that he was sad when his mother died. It's not enough for a connection. It's not enough to justify the time. The same thing happens again at Harry's Heal the World Foundation. We're given a 20-minute tour of the place, during which Peter is revealed to be smart, and Harry, again, is revealed to be nice. Well, that and his love for his mother. And then it happens again at Coney Island, which is also long and also fails to further our connection to Harry, Peter, or MJ. All that time, mostly for the sake of Harry's character, and we've barely moved an inch. It's not, and never is, that any of this is bad. Insomniac keep the moments coming, with Harry's rickroll or nerd emoji Peter struggling to control his powers. The environments are so absurdly detailed that they somehow manage to entertain through brute force alone. The level of life and excitement and sheer stuff in Coney Island is hypnotizing, and you can even go on all the rides, as broken as some of them might be. What? How'd she beat me? But it's slow, and it's long, and it's not that fun, and I still kind of find myself loitering in the city when I know one of these levels is coming up next to slam the brakes, and when the story's not making that worth your while, it's a problem. It's a problem almost entirely localized to Act 1. And though Act 1 is still mostly good, that's not its only problem. Why? It's a question you're going to be asking a lot. Why have you brought this back? Why have you put this in? Why am I doing this instead of something good? There's a side of the early game that encapsulates all the worst tendencies of Insomniac's campaigns. You want to know why Harry's Heal the World tour takes 20 minutes? That'd be because you have to listen to a lecture on declining bee populations, shoot ARB predators with a drone, then listen to another lecture, this time on food insecurity, and do a genetics minigame to modify a crop. You might suspect the idea was to raise awareness of real-world issues, but on either subject, they don't do that very well. It's not interesting or emotional. It doesn't serve the Spider-Man fantasy, and it sure as shit isn't fun. So, why? Why, as another example, in the name of Tap Dancing Christ, are we spending a good 10 minutes in an already lengthy introduction talking about the ethics of using a startup's drone launcher to create and then physically guide a spider bot into the sky twice 
so that we'll be able to locate random crimes, as if the notion of Spider-Man stopping crimes was something that needed extensive tutorialization. And yes, they brought back the science minigames, this time much improved, but unlike MJ's missions, not to the point that they're good now. You shoot the bad atoms to isolate the good ones, and if the bad atom is too close to a good one, you shoot a neutral atom nearby. That's it. If chemistry was that easy, I'd be in a different profession. Genetics is far better. You need X amount of each type, but they also need to fit together. That means thinking ahead. So there is a degree to which you can wing it, but only a degree. It's not bad, but it does have the detriment of extending the time between what's good. Kinda like the spider drone, which can do a small fraction of the things a spider can, slower and less impressively. Leading me to wonder why, in any case we're asked to use it, that we aren't just doing this as Spider-Man instead. To be fair, the xylophone was pretty cool. Human their instrument and their soul. Beyond that, even something as simple as clearing rubble in what might as well be a series of quick time events excites less when you're doing it as a robot. This shit happens too much during the first third of the game. It's why I met the first MJ mission with a sigh, and still do, despite knowing it's a decent time. So what, some may furiously object? Would you prefer it if the whole game was just endless combat then? No. That's a false dichotomy, but it's one the game makes it easy to believe, because this just stops. After Act 1, there's one long man section to go, and then it's over, and it's an action game till the credits. So let's talk about Act 2, by which I mean endless combat. Of all the things that needed to improve, the combat was what needed to improve the least. It's everything I wanted Insomniac's web swinging to be. Easy to learn, but hard to master. Relentlessly cool. It had an incredibly large moveset too, that allowed you to solve any given problem in an incredibly large number of ways. That was the groundwork for creative expression. But in order to actively encourage creativity, Insomniac employed a simple contrast. Your basic grounded combo was weak, likely to be interrupted. Low knockback, low damage, but everything else was strong. Gadgets, webs, launches, juggles. So do anything else. Fight like Spider-Man. There was depth to go along with the chaos. You had the usual shit. Enemy prioritization, mastering enemy attacks, ammo management for the web shooters, spending takedowns wisely. But there was also a remarkable wealth of depth in positioning. Your strongest attack was throwing an environmental object into an enemy. But what made that more interesting than merely choosing which enemy to bonk was that when you initially grabbed the object, it could hit enemies in its path on its way to you. And that when you whirled it above your head, you could hit enemies near you. So this was hugely optimizable depending on where you stood. Your second strongest attack was launching yourself from the environment, and that meant anywhere. A wall, a van, a railing, a perch. So again, hugely optimizable. And your other strongest attack was webbing an enemy onto the environment or launching a webbed enemy into the environment at speed. There was more than one way to web enemies, and there were loads of different things you could do to launch enemies. Hitting them with an object, or an air yank, or a slide dodge, or a swing kick. That created a consistent potential for small but creative multi-step plans. But there was more. You could launch them into a specific environmental attack, or into other enemies, or into another part of the arena to space them out, or off a rooftop entirely, or into a wall, which would then lead you into a launch attack. In any given frame of gameplay, the potential for optimization and expression was immense. It wasn't the coolest Spider-Man combat, but it was the best, and it comfortably took its place by Arkham's side. So. Couldn't be improved, right? Ha, no, the joke's getting old. There were messy and imbalanced things. A general presence of jank and man were gadgets in a rough spot. Refinement was easy to imagine. Significant expansion though, not so much. What was there to expand? Well, Insomniac don't seem to know. And when I first played Spider-Man 2, I found that disappointing. With three games in and three hours in, the muscle memory I developed years ago had returned to me. I felt like I was playing the same game. But the more time passed, the less I cared about that. And by the end of my second run, I realized I had more fun with the combat in this game than I had in the first two combined. It wasn't because of the new stuff. The parry is satisfying, and it effectively raises the challenge when an enemy requires it. But it's just not very important. You perform an act of perfect timing, and in return, you get four empowered punches which will probably be interrupted. Not a very good deal. Perhaps that was the idea. Maybe they didn't want people to prioritize parries because seeing Spider-Man parry anything is just a bit awkward. Maybe I'm wrong. Either way, it's no big deal. The new air combos weren't either. Sweet, slick, but nothing I couldn't already do. 
The deal starts getting bigger with Insomniac's refinements. Special attacks return from Miles Morales, and Peter now has them too. There's nothing particularly interesting about the attacks themselves, but Spider-Man 2's smart idea was giving each one its own cooldown, instead of having them all draw from a single resource. This way, you're hurting yourself if you're not using each one regularly, which means you will use them, and make uniquely interesting choices about how best to use a throw or an AoE, instead of continually defaulting to what's easiest in the moment the punch. So that's a solid step forward. On the other side of the coin, and on the other side of the screen, are the gadgets. Which is an immediate win, because that means the weapon wheel is gone. And if you're not sure why we should be sending a prayer of thanks up to Biggie B Winterhar for that one, I'll enlighten you. Constantly interrupting the energy of a fight with a menu sucks. That's fundamental. It also sucked because the web shooters, one of your foundational abilities, were considered a gadget. Which meant any time you wanted to use something else, you'd need to switch once, and then switch back. And it sucked even harder because because wanting to avoid the weapon wheel discouraged experimentation with all the gadgets. There was no materialistic reason not to use the electric web, but no one did. The weapon wheel is why, and it is a colossal win to see that barrier gone. The more interesting debate is the matter of the gadgets themselves. There's only four to the first game's eight. They're all new. And looking at the roster, it seems Insomniac have chosen to de-emphasize gadgets that constitute a play in and of themselves. So no set-and-forget damage dealers like the spider drone. No instant kills like the trip mine or the impact web. Now, to some, that's a tragic loss, and though I won't deny how good it felt to use them, the truth is, it was never healthy for the best play at the start of every fight to be mindlessly throwing out your instant kills. Whether you acted on that incentive or not, I won't miss it being there. Here's where Insomniac missed. What we got in return. Until you upgrade the web grabber to the point it can latch onto objects as well as people, it seems the intention was to promote synergy. It pulls enemies close together. That's it. It's a setup. You have to create the payoff. Interesting. The others, though, are not interesting. The upshot brings a group of enemies into the air, but in the air, you can only really do anything to one enemy at a time. So rather than big brain moves, you'll mostly use the upshot as an interruption. The ricochet web, meanwhile, webs up multiple enemies. But unlike the web bomb, it spreads its webbing in an unpredictable pattern, which makes it far harder to work into any larger play. So again, mostly used as an interruption. In terms of synergetic potential, we're arguably behind the first game. And there's not as many. It's underwhelming. It says a lot, then, that gadgets are still in the best state they've ever been. Freed of that weapon wheel, I used them. All of them. And never to mindlessly farm free kills. It's not the only thing resembling an exploit that Insomniac have addressed. It was never difficult to turn rooftop battles into a strawberry jam conveyor belt. With standard thugs, who cares, it's funny. But hunters, whose fights are meant to be a challenge, can now counter players who abuse that. Basically, Insomniac have run a clean-up operation, paving over the imbalances and removing the barriers, so that when they decide to challenge you, you're pushed towards mastery, not abusable tactics and exploitation. And boy, did they decide to challenge you. Spider-Man 2 has a much steeper difficulty curve than the first game. Frankly, it has a much steeper difficulty curve than most games. It's noticeable that every fight in the campaign, and I do mean just about all of them, is in some way significantly harder than the last. Maybe it's more enemies, maybe it's tougher enemies, Either way, it's noticeable, assuming you've picked the right difficulty setting, that you're consistently being pushed to the edge of your ability, and as a direct result, that you're consistently getting better. Timing, strategies, gadgets, things you forgot from the last two games and things you never learned because you never had the push. Spider-Man 2's boss fights have an important role here. They're actually hard this time, and instead of unique encounters, they focus on challenging the combat mechanics, parry timing, dodges, but also optimizing the use of webs and gadgets, all of which are transferable skills into regular encounters. You'll come out the other end of that three-boss gauntlet at the end of Act 2 measurably better at the game. Difficulty, encouraging mastery. It's an easy thing to describe, but the effect is profound. I realized something when I returned to the first game. I never used to play this well back in the day. Sure, I got good, but never that good. I had fun, but not as much as I was having moments after returning all this time later. It was because I had played Spider-Man 2 that I was able to both describe prior versions with sharper focus and get more out of them. It's not magic. It's a good difficulty curve. And that, for me was the best move Insomniac made for their combat. But there are still more things to like. The arenas have improved, with destructibility rising across the board. You'll be punching people through walls in Craven's Mansion. Most of the fighting spaces in the campaign prioritize verticality, too, keeping your environmental options high. And I like the changes to the focus bar. 
You need a full bar to heal now, and in the context of higher challenge, that brings tension to the time it takes to fill it, a stronger sense of relief when it does fill, and a stronger tactical value to the things that can fill it faster, which Insomniac used successfully to further encourage the use of webs. Because you also need focus for finishers, being comfortable spending it on a finisher instead of saving it for a heal noticeably heightens the satisfaction, recontextualizes finishers from something that just happens with time, into a reward for good play. Again, this relies on the context of higher challenge. The only problem is that the focus bar is too small. It's literally too small on the screen, which can make it hard to see exactly how much there is left to go from your peripheral vision. That can be distracting, and that's had me hit more than once. I'd also like to see more enemy variety in the future. The hunters are excellent, but it's just the hunters until Act 3. Another faction, and the benefit would have been big. Fix that, fix the UI, fix the gadgets, and fix the jankiness that continues to have a presence, and I wouldn't know where else the system could go. God of War style combos, maybe? I look forward to being enlightened. So, given this assessment, you might not think endless combat sounds like a raw deal. Which is good, because it isn't. I like Act 2 more than Act 1. But here's the thing. As we've just said with regards to enemies, even great things stand to benefit from a little variation. Arkham knew that. It varied great systems with other great systems. I wish Spider-Man did the same thing. You can have gameplay that is neither combat, nor this. The proof's in the game in the potential of its own systems that Insomniac have sadly continued to neglect. Like stealth. What happened here, man? Three entries and still the same problems. Let's get some perspective. This safe danger alert system is not normal. It's not normal for a stealth game to be designed around a text box that guarantees success or failure, removing any need to be situationally aware, removing any trace of tension besides the tension that stems from wondering whether or not it'll actually work. It doesn't even work all the time! How's that possible? Does it make it very accessible to look at some cool animations? You bet. Is it possible to be more than mediocre when your system relies on what in any other game would be called a cheat code? Not even remotely. The AI is still poor, you've still got to deal with one enemy spots you, everyone spots you. You've still not got many options. And you've actually got less, because remember, the trip mine is gone. Let's be honest, the trip mine was never interesting. You just planted it under their scrotum and waited for the tug. But at least it was funny. In return for all this, Insomniac have given us the web line. With it, you can essentially design your own perch takedown opportunities. And that element of responsibility does enhance the satisfaction over the course of the encounter, especially as you look back at the art of your handiwork after the fight is done. Before long though, it becomes clear that being able to perch takedown from anywhere makes the perch takedown kind of powerful. Then you get the double perch takedown upgrade, and kind of powerful becomes the best solution to any problem stealth will ever present you with, making encounters both easier and vital vastly more repetitive than ever before. Three entries in, and we've gone backwards. It's an embarrassment. But don't take my word for it, there's like four opportunities to do stealth in the entire campaign. And though it's not impossible to return to stealth once you're detected, the fact that it takes the effort it does is part of a very conscious effort to encourage you not to. There is so much potential for Spider-Man stealth to work. Don't let it slip a fourth time, Insomniac. So what about Spider-Man's movement? Uh, good question. It's deep now. The potential's there for Insomniac to stress it, so it's a shame that just doesn't happen. Not even in the game's three set-piece chases. Now, these have been tradition since the before times when the 3D graphics didn't even realistic. But instead of challenging your ability to keep up with a target, Insomniac's rendition are more about guiding Spider-Man through a series of heavily scripted explosions. The chase isn't the point. The set-piece is. If you can swing in a straight line, you've won. If you can swing a little faster, it'd be hard to tell. Because I suspect Insomniac have to throttle your top speed to make sure nothing falls out of alignment. And the vehicle takedowns? Some of them are literally just cutscenes. It's this lack of involvement that allows Insomniac the fine control it takes to choreograph some of the coolest shit to come out of the AAA sphere. But in a contradictory way, it's the same lack of involvement that limits their ability to thrill. You don't feel like you're balancing on the knife's edge. You don't believe in the chance of failure, or that it's through your action that you're staying afloat. Which is why, as impressive as the fireworks may be, chases that made me feel responsible are still just as exciting as those made on a hundred times the budget. Whatever sacrifices it takes to integrate some element of participation are worth making, and the potential for movement to matter, not just to chases and set pieces, but to the campaign broadly, is immense. It is disappointing that in a game with two playable Spider-Men, the deepest movement in a superhero game since Web of Shadows, and stealth with such clear potential, that Insomniac looked to ARB drones for variation, and then just stopped. Filling that void is how a damn good campaign can become great. Now, between the punches and explosions, Act 2's got a story. 
the Black Suit arc. Because when Spider-Man rushed to save MJ in the abandoned zoo, Craven chinged him down, and the symbiote chose to abandon Harry to save the stronger host's life, in a sequence that is worthy of particular praise. Of course, we know Peter won't die, but he doesn't, and nor does MJ, as he breathlessly tries to tell her what he'll never get another chance to, and she desperately tries to convince herself that nothing's wrong. The emotion is easy to connect to. That leaves Harry without the thing that was keeping him alive, and sets Peter on the classic symbiote path, the path to arrogance, rage, and power. So, a good start. Unfortunately, Act 2's second, Infection, is shallow characterization. The most immediately obvious way that emerges is with Harry. His time to develop is done, now Harry's life serves as a time limit. Motivation for Peter to find a way to free himself of the suit. Trouble is, Act 1 didn't do its job. I cared about Harry insofar as I liked him, and it would be nice if he didn't have to die. But I certainly didn't connect with him as much as would have been ideal as the central motive of the story. Not even close. This. The Harry problem is one of Insomniac's biggest fuck-ups across the board. Now, part two of shallow characterization is Craven. He's got cancer, and he wants to die in battle before it kills him. That's it. That's Craven. He's neither explored nor developed beyond this basic motive. And even as basic motives go, it's remarkably difficult to connect to this one. You know, unless you're a Viking from 900 AD who can relate to the compulsion to die honorably in battle. I'm not saying Craven is bad. I'm saying he's one-dimensional and the most emotionless core villain we've had yet. Then there's Peter, or the symbiote, I should say. Insomniac have a fresh take on things. Unfortunately, it's fresh in the sense that I've never seen anything quite this shit before. Okay, wait, let me just say that I'm only talking about the character level. Instead of serving as a complex character of its own or elevating the temptations and impulses that exist within the host, Insomniac Symbiote is one-dimensional, inherently evil, and it implants its evil inside the host as an exterior possessive force. It literally whispers words of malice into Peter's ear. It fully possesses his sleeping body, turning into a raging, feral beast. Its intentions are unchanged by and independent of the human wearing it, and they are as boring as they could possibly be. The notion that the symbiote's will to take over the world comes from Harry's will to heal it is a misconception. It's revealed by Dr. Connors that the symbiote landed with a meteorite, whose only known function is to spread symbiote biomass. It's explicitly called a seed. In the very cutscene where Venom commits to the plan, the symbiote introduces the idea, impersonates Harry's mother, and heal the world is merely used as a means of convincing Harry to play along. There's no depth to the motivation here. As Peter's time with the suit continues, he becomes increasingly violent, short-tempered, and selfish. But this change isn't driven by Peter or anything that happens in the story. It's simply the byproduct of time wearing the symbiote. It's time, not something within the host or anything the host chooses, that grows the symbiote's strength and malice, as we're shown again when it passes from Peter to Harry and then to MJ, each time becoming stronger and more immediately possessive. Venom bears no specific resentment for Peter's abandonment, because in this iteration, the symbiote is less like a character and more like a machine, emotionless and with a singular materialistic goal. When we fight Venom and Scream and we beat them into a weakened state, a clear distinction is made between the characters of the host and the symbiote. The host is confused and unwilling. The symbiote takes pleasure in its possession. Insomniac work hard to de-emphasize character. But despite all this, it's true that the symbiotes talk like their hosts. It's also true that Insomniac do try to establish some element of character motivation, with a process made visual when we delve into Peter's mind, and learn that the symbiote has latched itself onto a psychological vulnerability. In his case, a feeling of powerlessness. He couldn't save May. He needs to be a better Spider-Man. Now, the first problem is that this isn't dramatized at all until a scene that takes place after the Black Suit arc has already concluded. It's mentioned on occasion, but a feeling of powerlessness is not dramatized in this story. Second problem, this one being more important, it doesn't matter. Wanting to be a better Spider-Man isn't what causes Peter's descent, time plus slime is. Insomniac have written their symbiote to be so external and possessive that even if a motive in the host exists, it's secondary, and ultimately meaningless beyond the words being spoken. And this is an agreed upon rule. When the suit comes off, that's it. All's forgiven. No one brings it up again. Peter returns to the status quo with Miles and MJ and even with himself, because to a large enough degree, no one believes he was truly responsible for his own actions under the influence of the symbiote. It's kind of incredible, in hindsight, that Peter doesn't have to confront a single consequence of his time in the suit besides being mean to Harry. Insomniac's de-emphasis of character makes the goo boring and removes the black suit arc from its emotional power. In those terms, it is the single weakest adaptation of the symbiote arc that I have ever seen. And it's those terms, character, that stands out as the clearest weakness of Act 2's story. 
The strength of Act 2's story is the same as the strength of Act 1, but bigger. The moments. Oh, the moments. There's a reason I said Craven wasn't bad, and there's a reason I specified the character level so crucially. As a screen presence, Craven is magnificent. Sharp performance, sharp dialogue, sharp knife. He's not an interesting character, but he's deeply entertaining. It's the same for the symbiote. As something that's cool, there may not be a stronger adaptation. Beating an unbreakable prison apart through unrepentant fury. The choreography of how it handles Lizard and Craven's men. Insomniac is so good at making the black suit feel strong that you don't even notice that it doesn't actually make you any stronger. In terms of the fear factor, they're not quite as successful. As spine-chilling as the symbiote's voice might have been, it's a short and rudimentary chase, the tension limited by the sense of being on rails, and the usual caveat of it being very obvious that MJ isn't going to come to any real harm. But its strengths justify its short length, and it's a brilliant idea, exciting somehow for the simple fact that it's happening. Then there's the bit where Miles fights Peter immediately after Peter fights Craven, and you get to use the bell the same way he used it against you. And then there's the bit where the coolest shit I've ever seen happens while you're chasing Lizard. And then there's the bit where Peter calls Harry a crackhead. But crack's exactly the point. That's what this is. It's an action movie. John Wick. Never that deep, but anti-boring. Man, you get to play as fucking Venom. Ah, oh, It's been done before, but it's never been done like this. Insomniac stopped at nothing. Venom's moveset is needlessly wide and needlessly well choreographed. The environment, needlessly destructive. Throwing a guy so hard he sticks to the wall for a moment is fun enough. Throwing that guy through a room first, that's something special. Look at the grab combo. Who asked for this? Insomniac demonstrated clear understanding here, and with Peter's symbiote suit rampages, that a power fantasy is at its strongest, when there's just enough challenge to prevent things becoming mindless, to stop you detaching Dr. Manhattan's style from your own strength. And what's more, is that there's a handful of unique depths to master. You've got a ranged weapon now, enemies, which works especially well on other ranged enemies. You've got a special attack on cooldown, shielded enemies who resist your standard melee combo and so encourage different strategies the ability to parry projectiles, and there's about a thousand things you can do to optimize the way it all looks. Finishes included, it's both funny and impressive that Insomniac managed to make Venom feel so fucking killer, while carefully avoiding anything brutal enough to raise the age rating. But somehow, they're still not finished delivering peak. There's emotion here too. When Peter took the suit, we saw Norman watch Harry fall apart again, furious with his failure to find a cure, broken by it. And now there's another disease, something somehow worse, and it's very easy to believe in his pain, as he begs Harry to stop over the intercom, making increasingly desperate, hopeless pleas. The writers dig deep and the performances deliver. This violent rampage is actually tragic. It's one of the game's few emotional peaks, and with some confidence, I'd call it one of the best things Insomniac have ever made. Ultimately, the rampage culminates with a fight against Craven. It's the hardest fight Venom has, but it's the easiest boss in the game serving again to balance engagement with fantasy, and to honor Craven whilst legitimizing his replacement. Craven dies a not very interesting character, but with the hardest send-off imaginable. Most of the boss fights, in fact, have a similar quality of being more effective as moments than they are as fights. The mechanical stress of what are always challenging encounters, paired with the unapologetic melodrama of John Pisano's score, and the best of the game's performances, helps elevate the narrative stress with such a powerful electricity that things that really shouldn't have worked, work. Climaxes to poorly realized conflicts are momentarily given a weight. The clearest example is when Spider-Man beats his wife. Instead of founding this fight on the trauma MJ experienced when she was almost torn to shreds by the man she loved, or Peter changing his fucking face all the time, the fight is almost entirely predicated on weak conflicts that the game didn't even establish, much less dramatize. MJ's offer to help with a mortgage hadn't been mentioned since it was laid on the table at the start of the game, and her job with Jonah, that she laments as if she was doing it for Peter's sake, was very plainly established as something she chose for her own reasons. We can assume something might have changed, but it would have been better, wouldn't it, if it had had been dramatized or addressed so that we didn't have to guess at the height of the resulting conflict. Apparently, she's been single-handedly holding their lives together. Yeah, maybe. It's possible that's true. I'd have preferred something beyond plausibility. This is then muddled even further by the characterization of the symbiote, because we can't even be sure if she's telling the truth or being honest with her feelings. Buried somewhere in this mess is a decently well-realized narrative thread. MJ's book on Simcaria failed. We understand that's part of the reason why she signed up with a bugle, and that she does not like it there, because it makes her dishonest. Her time with the symbiote lends her the confidence to commit to what she believes in. 
That's something. It's a spark. What's staggering is that this fight has power far beyond that of a spark. You've got John Pisano losing his fucking mind on the strings. You've got Yuri Lowenthal breaking his voice, almost brought to tears by hearing MJ say these things, even though they don't make any sense. Somehow, this fight is one of the emotional peaks of Spider-Man 2's story. Okay, that's not saying much. So perhaps it'd be better to tell you that there is some emotion here, and that Peter V. Miles, Craven, and Lizard all benefit in a similar way. The degree to which this game is able to brute force its way past what should be crippling weaknesses is remarkable. It can't be great like this, but there wasn't a moment that I thought, this isn't good. Well, not yet. But the smart thing to talk about next is the boss fights as boss fights. We're looking at what might be Spider-Man 2's furthest leap ahead of its predecessors. So, we're trading unique encounters for a comprehensive test of the combat system. Downside? Spider-Man's combat heavily prefers grounded humanoid enemies, so don't expect these to work as variation. Upside? Really good mechanics. We've got the basic shit. Some attacks force a dodge or a jump or a parry. Some attacks can be avoided in your own way. Enemies have time delays in their combos to prevent you thoughtlessly spamming the dodge button. There are enough attacks to prevent repetition, more laid on as the phases progress, and, where possible, they reflect the character of the boss remarkably well. Craven's moveset is just so huntery, you know what I mean? Now here's where things get a bit more technical. For the sake of animation flow, Insomniac's combat completely immobilizes Spider-Man's targets while they're being attacked. So the bosses need some way to escape this immobilized state, and they do that with crude but necessary combo breakers, that then leads into an attack. It works. But there's more. To some degree, you can extend the amount of time you have before this happens. If a boss usually combo breaks on Spider-Man's fourth punch, you can use a gadget to prevent that. Or a special attack. Or you could uppercut the boss into the air. They'll break out eventually. But there are also things you can do to interrupt their attacks. Gadgets, special attacks, or webbing. So there's challenge in mastering the boss's moveset, but there's also depth in learning how best to apply your own, defense and offense. Add to that using webs for faster heals, the air for faster special attacks, using environmental opportunities at the right time. There's a lot going on here. They stay mechanically interesting not just for multiple phases, but for multiple runs. Let me be clear, as boss fights go, we're on the high end. Not that high though, there are a lot of problems. Most of the time, combo breakers are enough to make sure the boss can do what it needs to do, but for some things, Insomniac fall on an even cruder solution. For instance, when the game decides Venom needs to break out his wings or his armor, he will just stop taking damage. And you won't know that, and you'll lose a special attack. And that'll feel like preem horseshit when a special attack could have saved you later on. Or maybe it's been decided Peter can't be stunned anymore, so he turns into a block of lead when he's webbing up the bell. In any case, you've lost something. And among those things is the immersion of the fight. It's as if the devs are stepping in, holding you back, like a kind of invisible wall. Then there's the invisible walls. These arenas are a crime. The problem is that they're just too small. Reason they can't be huge is that Insomniac want bespoke environmental interactions, but that doesn't mean they have to be so small that aerial fights with mobile enemies have you constantly plonking your head off the ridiculously tight level boundaries. It's frustrating with Peter, who you fight in a fucking cramped phone box that's mostly the same color as him, leading to poor readability. But it's a massive problem with Scream, who is the most agile boss in the game and who would be my favorite fight in the game. If it weren't for the fact that returning her agility will lose your resources, the upper hand, and your bearings repeatedly. The problems continue with simpler things. The camera can get stuck on debris and because you're on a controller, there's only so fast it can rotate. So when the boss zips past you and immediately begins an attack, it's possible to not have reaction time. The broadest problem though is inconsistency. The spider rush just doesn't work sometimes. The uppercut won't always interrupt the boss. Neither will the swing kick. The point at which special attacks will interrupt the boss is often poorly defined. There's a degree of messiness in all the fights that emerge from the simple fact that the combat system isn't accustomed to being used on enemies who can dance out of range or completely rebuff you. There's some refinement sorely needed. And that leaves us with Lizard. Lizard has a lot of problems, and most of them are problems that only Lizard has. For instance, when Lizard jumps up onto the walls, you're supposed to time a yank on the grates he passes. But if you miss both opportunities, the solution you'll most likely arrive at is to go up there and knock him down by hand. Now, you're supposed to web him up before you do that. But the only way to learn this neat little fact is through a tool tip that only sometimes appears. If you don't catch the info, Lizard will break the space-time continuum to stop you from landing a hit. There's a slam that has no physical telegraph and a crush attack, both of which can come out in a matter of frames if you're close enough. Why? Why are you doing this to me? It goes on. With no fair warning, the scream can hit you twice. Lizard is the only boss with hitbox problems.
you still owe me 25 health points, Insomniac. There's an attack that simply doesn't give you fair reaction time, which, due to its rarity and the fact that Lizard normally uses it up on the walls, seems to me like a bug. There's this. What the fuck is this? And there's also a huge amount of attack magnetism on Lizard's front side, but almost none on his back, which can cause you to miss attacks that would otherwise have landed. One of the most regular frustrations was the stagger. When you hit Lizard with a grate, you can go in for a critical combo, but that combo only initiates or succeeds under precise conditions. You have to be facing from the perfect angle, and you can only be pressing square. If you're in the air for a second, if there's a web strike or an uppercut or a gadget involved, if you aren't angled just so, or you started hitting him from the side, you won't get the damage. It's so finicky that even random things like a bit of debris can mean failure. The boy is not finished. Be reasonable to assume, then, that I don't like this fight. Well, we're still not on speaking terms, but it should say a lot that I do. Even when I was getting my ass beat, even when it wasn't really fair. The spectacle was there, the challenge was there, the moveset was fun to master. The negatives are numerous, and on higher difficulties, deeply frustrating. But the positives outweigh them, by a lot. I'd happily fight Scream several times again in spite of her arena. I'd tank the bullshit to redo Peter. These fights are a highlight of the game, and some of the best in the superhero genre. Man. Oh shit, I forgot about Miles. Well, I'm not the only one. Talking about Miles can often feel secondary in any discussion of Spider-Man 2's narrative, mainly because he is secondary in the narrative, and that's being generous. He isn't in the game very much. When he is, he usually suffers from one of a long list of problems, like, for instance, being completely disconnected from most of the important characters in the story, which, unfortunately, means Miles' presence often comes with a flat reduction in energy. Miles doesn't know Felicia like Peter does. Miles hasn't shared a rivalry with Craven or any of Craven's victims. Miles doesn't know Venom, or Harry, or what it is to be lost in the symbiosaurus, which is why his phases of the Venom fight just don't have the same intensity. It's energy that characterizes the problem with the plot, too. Switching from the blistering pace of Peter's story to Miles, whose weak narrative direction has him practically sitting around, waiting for the next small problem to solve, waiting for the A-plot to need him, is less like a break in the pacing and more like falling off a pacing cliff. Okay, so what about the character level? What's going on in his head? Um, you don't want to know. But usually, I think the problem with Miles' conflicts boil down to underdevelopment. There's always not enough of something, like the 500 words he finds himself incapable of writing for his college entrance essay. It stands to reason that being unable to describe oneself would represent a struggle with identity. Even if it weren't Miles fucking Morales we're talking about, a character for whom identity problems are written so often across Spider-Man media that it almost seems like it's done out of habit. But here's the thing. Beyond two paragraphs of writing, this struggle doesn't amount to anything. It's never discussed or further explored. It's not even explained, which it really needed to be, because it's difficult to imagine where identity problems would even come from for this Miles Morales, a man who proved himself as the one and only Spider-Man to the entire city, a man who bears such strong relations to his culture, community, friends, and interests. Would you connect to a plotline about Elon Musk feeling broke? But it's not the only thing Miles has going on. The second thing, and the better thing by far, is his burning resentment of Martin Lee. Makes sense why he'd want to hunt the guy who queffed your dad, and it actually is dramatized, at least at the start, where we see Miles block out the needs of soon-to-be blended innocence and his focus on Lee. Unfortunately, between this event and the climax of this plotline, the dramatization stops. There's no consequence nor any further development of Miles' vengeful impulse. In fact, Miles doesn't even act on it. He just tells us he wants to. The idea of Miles pursuing Lee is simply repeated, again and again and again as if saying it enough will make a seed of drama become drama. To be fair, it ends well enough. Miles can't forgive Lee, but following a strong fight and a series of awkward corporations, he learns to let go of feelings that don't serve him, and Lee, seemingly inspired, commits to pursuing redemption, returning to the man he once pretended to be. It's a mature and productive message. It's good. Shame Miles isn't. Okay, next point. Because Miles' plotline doesn't have the energy to distract you from this, he suffers the most from one of the broadest problems with all Insomniac Spider-Man stories. The truth is, you guys, Miles never had much swagger. He's actually quite bland. And to be fair, it's not just him. It's his mates. It's his girl. It's most of the people he interacts with, and it is Peter's circle, too. In terms of personality, they're all really polite. Polite in a strangely formal way. I don't quite know how to put it. They talk like their employers are listening. 
Because it's so common, and because it's so often the most notable feature of their personalities, it comes to render dialogue dry and predictable. Many of the words written for Genki could be spoken by Mary Jane, or Peter, or any scientist at the EDF, and you wouldn't be able to tell. The humor's got the same agonizingly safe job application quality, the affectation of social awkwardness despite not actually being socially awkward. You know the drill, their default on the character creation screen, sourceless. According to some truly remarkable takes I've seen online, the reason Peter isn't always as funny in this game as he used to be is because of depression, huh? So, depression doesn't make you joke any less often, or stop you from going about life in a generally upbeat manner. It just makes your jokes less funny. Interesting. Now that's a knuckle sandwich! Sourcelessness is more of a problem than just not being as entertaining as it could have been. Friends don't talk with the formal politeness that Miles and Genki talk with. It feels plastic. Nice one, Genki. Got us one step closer to solving this thing. It doesn't feel real. And you need to have chemistry to get me invested in a romance. But if you thought Peter and MJ didn't quite have that spark, wait until you see Miles and Haley. It was this kind of sourcelessness, as much as knowing I'd be playing as man too, that discouraged me from helping Miles' classmates for the Brooklyn Vision side quests. I know we all think life is strange as cringe, but the truth is, I'd take cringe over lifeless any day of the week. Even Ronnie Robertson suffers. He's your photography contact. Now, the main problem with Ronnie Robertson is that his insights on the subjects of your photographs make SS Sniper Wolf look like a fucking scholar. New York's nothing without its people. Thanks, Ronnie. Just say damn that's crazy next time. But the other problem with Ronnie Robertson, and the reason you probably didn't remember his name, is that his only personality trait is being positive towards things that exist. It's like he's writing for his LinkedIn page. It's a shame that Insomniac's Peter and MJ are the most unseasoned Peter and MJ we've seen in big budget media. But I think the biggest part of this problem is Harry, the guy motivating the plot. It doesn't help that he's the human embodiment of a bread sandwich. What's curious is that the villains don't have this problem. After all this time, Electro still stands out in my mind because of how much charisma he had. And that's part of the reason it feels so cheap for Craven to have killed him off screen. So perhaps it's not Insomniac being incapable, but rather their commitment to casting the allied characters in a perfectly idealized, inoffensive mold that sterilizes all charm away. This isn't among the biggest problems, but it's not insignificant either. I hope Insomniac see fit to open up the spice rack in the future. Now's probably a decent time to talk about the podcasts. The problems here aren't something you can boil down to personality. It's more about being very, very one-dimensional, on account of being utterly beholden to an incredibly shallow formula. For Danica, it's event happens, express concern, and say something vaguely progressive. For Jameson, it's event happens, blame Spider-Man. They will almost never defend these points or expand upon them. Instead, they remind you of their tendencies, then leave. That becomes incredibly repetitive, and it sure as shit does doesn't help that this has been a problem since the first game, or that Jameson still isn't very funny. Spider-Man 2's only innovation here is a new sense of incohesion that stems from the fact that the podcasters seem to have access to a copy of the script. Somehow, they know exactly what's happening, exactly when certain subjects have become relevant to the plot, and exactly how to feel about them. Things like Miles being kidnapped and Danica reporting him missing, despite the fact that he went missing last night, which is something people often do on account of being asleep. Or commenting on the Emily May Foundation, which has existed for months, immediately after Peter makes his first visit. Or knowing exactly how to feel about the black suit, despite having no means of confirming her conveniently accurate suspicions beyond, and I quote, it giving her the heebie-jeebies. Thing is, if she's always right, then what's the point in her? Because that way she's always saying something we already know, feeling the way we already feel. Wouldn't it be more interesting if she was always wrong? Giving us insight into the public's perception of the narrative based on their limited information. And since we're on the topic, I'll also complain about how all three of the people she interviews on her program happen to be from Spider-Man's social circle. Podcasts have an opportunity to give New York a voice, make it feel like a real place, that's their best and broadest potential. Instead, they make it feel small, and more like it's made for you. It sucks they've missed again. So, how about we talk about the side quests? It's a mixed bag, charitably. High end, you got short but decidedly touching conversations with Howard the Pigeon Man, and a woman's demented grandpa that serve as light meditations on losing oneself and what we leave behind when we're gone. Temperature Online will have you believe Howard's mission is on par with Schindler's List. It's not. It's as subtle as a bulldozer, and it's predicated on the existence of a magical disease that kills you in the five minutes after you allude to it. But seeing a dying man think only of the innocent beings he's responsible for, and the contrast of knowing something's wrong with Peter's naive hopefulness, is deeply bittersweet, and strongly elevated by the use of licensed music. 
Other quests had their moments too. Ryo is one of the only charming allied characters left. Anything with her in it is a win. And there's even a boss fight against Wraith, which is nearly as good as the other boss fights. Unfortunately, this fight is among the only good things about the Wraith quest, which is dragged down to mediocrity by needless use of the spider bot, focusing on an incredibly boring cult, not having an ending to set up carnage for future content, and Wraith herself, who just feels a bit silly. Yuri was a good cop set on a dark path by the deaths of her team at the hands of Hammerhead. She was cool. She was believable. Then, suddenly, she's this. What? How'd that happen? We've gone from reasonably grounded rogue cop to Jane Sekiro throwing hands with superheroes, and swinging from buildings with a scythe. It's that particular contrast more than any broken rule of the world that makes the absence of any context or explanation stand out. Her threads aren't the worst of the game's wardrobe problems, but they're close. And the edge, man, the edge, she just doesn't pull it off. You're not her, Yuri. Sourceless. For the narrative, they go for the classic pro-killing versus anti-killing thing, and the classic arguments for either side are passably made. But we've heard it all before, and Insomniac have nothing new to say, nor any ambition to say it any better or any differently. We don't have the strength of Daredevil's dialogue, characterization, and acting. We don't have the emotional stakes of Batman vs. Red Hood. I think this is mid. Miles doesn't fare much better. Rescuing stolen jazz museum exhibits has the benefit of having Rio in it, an ending with some interesting history. But it's very unremarkable in terms of what you're doing. Go to place, punch a thug. Like a string of random crimes. And the plot? Shit, you're telling me the rich businessman, who also happens to be the only character here in Somniac aren't actively idealizing, was the bad guy the whole time? Wait, you're actually telling me that? Okay. And I don't want to be too dismissive towards Miles' high school quests, because there are some things to like. But it's hard to get around the fact that they are mostly helping boring people do something boring, boringly. The why question returns, though I suppose it never really left. Told you before about shooting ARBs. Well, the EDF City activities also include watering plants and doing mid mini games. And I've told you what's wrong with the rest of the city activities too, but further problems set in as time progresses, and it's around Act 2 3 that you'll start to notice. One's the lack of a difficulty curve. The first drone chases are alright, cool music, cool visuals, but because the paths are scripted and the order you do them in is uncertain, they can't get harder with time. What might have thrown you off at the start will soon become mindless. Same deal with the Prowler Stashes or Sandman Sandmen who you'll come to knock down like they were made of sand. Mysterio's got a slightly different problem. Because Spider-Man gets so much stronger with time through progression elements, it can feel like you're putting yourself at a major disadvantage if you do them near the start of the game, which can lead to them becoming backloaded, which can lead to them becoming ignored. But the content itself is solid. Combat challenges have always been solid. They've got the best resolution too. This is not designed to the standard of the game's other boss fights, but it's fun, and it's wacky, and it ends with a cool twist. Other resolutions include a 15 second cutscene of Spider-Man placing a Sandman crystal on his daughter's porch, a 15 second cutscene of Spider-Man interacting with a character who you won't recognize from the animated movies because she was cut, and for the Hunter drones, being told that a villain exists. You know, like a teaser for content that isn't in the game. Great! Spider-Man 2's flaws can't be boiled down to one thing. Sometimes it seems like weak ideas, and sometimes it seems like weak execution. And sometimes it seems like the execution is weak, because Insomniac simply ran out of time. Signs of that third thing become increasingly clear as time goes on. You see it in obvious things. There's no New Game Plus, no Time of Day selector, no podcast replay, no crime replay. There's bugs, more than there have ever been. Maybe that's also why for MJ and Miles it feels like there were scenes missing, or that the podcasts are constantly interrupted by things they shouldn't be interrupted by, even at times by literally nothing, or the game making less and less sense as time goes on. The biggest problem with Act 3 is Venom. According to Dr. Connors, the only way to stop Harry's weight gain problem is to kill him. Peter doesn't take that news so well, and that's the emotional crux from here until the end. But me? Well, it's the Harry problem. I don't care enough. What's worse is that this is now combined with the second weak character. Venom's a two-for-one deal, and Harry's not really in the driver's seat. That'd be the one-dimensional evil goo. But despite that, it's true that Venom talks like Harry, and that sometimes he acts like Harry. To what degree we're supposed to interpret these things as honest expressions of his character or calculated manipulations of the symbiote? Who knows? But unfortunately, not knowing who you're talking to makes it challenging to emotionally connect. Harry is a weak character, and the symbiote is a weak character, and Venom is both, and neither. 
He's a mess, elevated only by the monstrous sense of presence Insomniac's visual design and Tony Todd's chilling performance lends him. It's funny, because the only other time Venom's been like this was Spider-Man Web of Shadows, and that's exactly what Act 3 is, Web of Shadows Remastered. Immediately following Craven's throat removal surgery, the symbiote endeavors to begin its invasion, and things get off to a decent start. Venom skulks in alleys and subways, quietly infecting the populace. Okay, we're really not being subtle about this, are we? But it works. The burning red sky elevates a sense of foreboding. The symbiotes come as a much-needed refreshment for the combat. They're an immediate difficulty spike. Not oppressive, but far quicker and tougher than anything before, which cements a sense of legitimacy. And far from being a reskin of the Hunters, there's more to master than timing. Banana flavor can fight back in the air. Apples lightning fast but weak to webs. Strawberry has a ranged grab attack, and Watermelon uses slow-moving bombs. Good stuff. The only real problem I have with the symbiotes is, well, that I just want to taste. You know what I mean? You guys know what I mean. Why the fuck do they look like licorice all sorts? They're meant to be demons poured from the black heavens above, not yummy. Not silly. Not a fan of the design language. But we don't have time to dwell. The sense of foreboding is incredibly short-lived. It seems only 15 minutes after meeting Venom's vanguard, nests and towering plumes of biomass emerge across the city. What's strange is that nobody seems to care. Is this kind of thing an everyday occurrence? Walking to work, 90-foot tendrils, Peter's just happy for MJ to work on her article with a view of a rapidly spreading alien demon infestation from her window? Moments later, the symbiotes launch a full-scale assault on City Hall, and neither before nor after does anyone outside of City Hall seem interested. Hmm, okay. Hope this isn't the start of a rapidly worsening trend, Insomniac. After City Hall, Venom takes the meteorite from Dr. Connors and with it, Manhattan. Stopping at Manhattan for some reason, despite the fact that the meteorite did all this in about two minutes. Not sure what the plan is there. Weirder though, is that we've skipped the part between the beginning of an invasion and a full-scale apocalypse in what feels like a heartbeat and with no explanation. Where'd everyone go? Things are real silent for an apocalypse that started two seconds ago. No reason to assume the spread will stop at the river either. MJ's still home, but people are still walking in Queens and Brooklyn like nothing's going on. No one, including Spider-Man's, trying to call anyone. Like, for instance, the army. Or S.H.I.E.L.D. When you rescue civilians in the two, three symbiote crimes, Spider-Man just leaves them there, tells them to go home as if Spider-Man himself can make it two blocks without getting jumped. Danica hops on the air to tell everyone about Feast supply runs. Feast? Do Feast have tanks now? Basically, the symbiote invasion isn't realized very well, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it isn't very dramatic, in part because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because what makes an apocalypse dramatic is its effect on people, and its effect on people is minimized, glossed over, or glaringly stupid. It's in the art, too. No plumes of smoke, no panic, no sirens, no humanity. Just silence and tentacles under a standard grey sky. Web of Shadows 2? More like Web of Shadows poo. It's not often you see Insomniac adapt source material this directly. Venom's rampage, a boss fight in Times Square, that was a homage to Ultimate. But this? This isn't homage. It's a rerun of a game that already exists, and that robs it of the benefit of novelty. Also means that losing the comparison, badly, at least for those who've played both, makes it much harder to see an upside here. Bad? No. But mediocre, certainly. But hey, if you thought the drama was lacking now, <laughs> the English language isn't capable of expressing what I think about this suit, but the good news is it doesn't need to because it's not the important thing. What's important is that even if you like the way the evolved suit looks, it still comfortably numbers among humanity's most heinous stains upon God's great creation. It's time for a Miles original, he says, forgetting the fact that the original suit was also a Miles original, then trading it for something that looks significantly more like Peter's costume and features a sponsorship from Adidas. But somehow, the worst part is the timing. Why in the fuck did Miles think the height of an alien invasion was the right time to break out the toothpaste cosplay? Who's he trying to impress? The bad sim bitches? Funny as it is, I'd say with some confidence that for most people, this did far more damage to the sense of seriousness than would have been ideal. Happens again one mission later when Peter's getting jumped by an army, and Miles, having told him he'll be there, decides to make asking Haley out as awkward and drawn out as possible. But that's still the small time if we're talking stupid shit. Next mission is the last mission. Yeah, Act 3 is really that short. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is Pete's master plan. The symbiotes have a hive mind, that's how we know where they're keeping the meteorite, so... Step 1. Send Peter in to lure out Venom whilst making no attempt to avoid it being blindingly obvious to Venom that we're deliberately trying to lure him out. Step two, send Miles in to distract the symbiotes. And step three, retrieve the meteorite. Guess who's retrieving the meteorite, guys? 
Now that's genius. The plan concocted with no hesitation by the man who loves her is to send a journalist into a doom eternal level with no help, no guarantee of minimal resistance, and no gun, it seems, from the way Peter only thinks to hand it over just before she goes in. Well, fuck me, what was the original plan? Podcast at them? And when you've made it out, it never occurs to either of the brightest minds in New York that it might have been safer and faster to swing MJ to the particle accelerator instead of watching her slowly ride her motorcycle through streets riddled with impassable tendrils and teeming with symbiotes. Insomniac tries so hard to make this boss fight work. The music's there, the performances are there, but they couldn't brute force their way through this one. It was gonna take more electricity than they ever could have summoned to make fighting this Venom land with the emotion I've come to expect from Insomniac's final bosses. You've got Peter and Venom arguing about grievances that go all the way back to their childhoods, but you've also got Insomniac explicitly stating, more than one time, that Harry is an unwilling and unaware participant. And it's like, why would you try to remind me of that? that we're fighting gaslight girl boss Goo instead of the human being inside. They don't even commit to killing Harry, cheapening any impact his death might have had. Act 3 is constantly and aggressively and increasingly stupid. And the emotion falls short, again. And the moments struggle to prop it up, partially because they're not very good, and partially because they don't exist enough, what with all this mostly being combat. Gameplay is too good for this to ever get bad, but these final hours are mediocre. With the curtains closed, the city didn't keep me going for long. Nests still tower above neighborhoods and groups of insane terrorists war with aliens on the street. While Danica proclaims, we did it, the sun comes out and the city returns to life. Does this really matter? Yes, it matters, because all that remains is this city, and I would like to be immersed in it. Swamped in reminders of the game's incohesion, faced with the choice between one boring activity or another, unable to live out my Spider-Man fantasies because there's no time of day selector, nor any ability to change the color of the symbiote, my best bet was to keep on swinging, and I did but not for long. The attitude Insomniac hold towards their open worlds is confusing. We have the best New York there has ever been in digital media, and just about every suit we could ever wish for. We have the pieces of an effective Spider-Man sandbox, with the potential to extend the life of the game for hours. But I can hardly feel like Bully Maguire without darkness and a raging storm, nor Tobey Maguire without honeyed sunlight. Maybe, when you're watching this video, the patch has dropped, but the point is this. For a feature that valuable, that simple, not to be prioritized, reflects what I think is unfortunate direction of Insomniac's open worlds. Instead of inhabiting the everyday role of Spider-Man, protector of this vast, impossible city, we interact with New York as a littering ground for snippets of conventional side content that anyone could do, that any game could have, all in the form of a numbered checkbox. Once it runs out, you're left with a handful of underbaked crimes, and the sense that you're killing time with a web swinging, not living a day as Spider-Man. I'm saying, I would like to deliver some pizza, for chases not to be a cutscene, and I want dynamic events like crimes that aren't crimes, like rescuing a balloon, or taking a selfie, or returning someone's hot dog, or choosing not to return an onion ring, or meeting another soup and challenging them to a race, or maybe just racing a guy on a bike. I want to play ball. I want a music player, or a radio for the postgame, and for there to be more than two podcasts, and for the podcast to be good. What about daily bugle bulletin photography quests that give you a vague objective and a reason to use the photo mode? Okay, now I'm getting ahead of myself. Basically, I want an open world Spider-Man gameplay loop for that to be the focus instead of things that will only ever feel secondary. This wonderful city deserves better than what it's used for. Insomniac's stratospheric potential deserves to be met, but it's time to stop dreaming. Here's the deal. Spider-Man 2 is a masterpiece. If you're 12. If not, it's an excellent action game, and about half the sequel it could have been. It leaps forward in some regards, it inches forward in others. It's so clearly limited by time, but elevated by Insomniac's unrelenting talent. There's no ending here that isn't bittersweet. I didn't love this game, found it hard to connect to, too sterile, too non-committal with its tone, too blasé about butchering its believability but I don't need to love it. Spider-Man 2 was never gonna win Game of the Year. Ask me, it shouldn't have even been nominated. But so what? Not every game needs to be Baldur's Gate 3. Not every superhero game needs to change things like Arkham. Spider-Man 2 doesn't need to be a masterpiece. It's so hard to make a damn good game. Something this fun, this entertaining. Insomniac have climbed mountains and have mountains more to climb. But where we are? It's like what Peter learned from May. He's enough. Not that he's going to feel that way until he unlocks next week's legendary champion on Raid Shadow Legends, baby! Woohoo! Let's fucking go!
Right, anyway, special thanks go out to L. Hudson, Lex Williams, Andre Baltuta, Holy Shift, Dennis Williams, Combat Wombat, John Lemley, Dylan Schaefer Murphy, Warthol, The Last Great Opium Den, how long do I need to make my username before White Light stops saying my name out loud? Dan Walker, Shinku, Caleb Finnamore, DJ, Chino, Chase Baker, G Series, William Vossela, Joe Simmons, I Pay My Cam Girl, So Why Not You, Navy Husky, Save, MT the Poet, Deluxo, Calvin Black, Dr. Pavel, Carlos Skibber, John C., Hidibari, Floyd Dibbon, Storyteller Max, Monochrome Only, Rollo Runner, Ethan Seach, Jack, Connor Fraser, Milo W., Jason H., Joshua Carr, Purple PP, Joshua Lovejoy, Ebla Eb Eblan Rhyme. Eblen Rhyme, Vincent DeLuca, Vedder, Cole Bramlett, Essel and Beneful the Doggo, Lubos Thomas, Prudy, White Light Best Girl, Milo Adams, Creepus, Tentmaster Kafka, Fares, Major Slimmer, Very Professional Dodo, Richard Burns, and Douglas Totally Straight Up Anonymous Yo. 